got word from my tech team that we are live now. So I first of all want to welcome the Zero Project family, and that is the over 3,400 participants who've joined in in this virtual global conference of ours. And the only reason why we can even begin to organize such a conference, over 90 hours of the content um, spread across three simultaneous TV channels and three days of conferencing is because we have such valued partners as Inclusion International. And I really want to extend a warm and welcome um, greeting from the entire Zero Project team who just wants to say uh, a, a big thank you. A big thank you to Inclusion International and for all the resources they've pooled and all the work they've done to coordinate speakers and bring them together here. And um, I personally really look forward to a very interesting session uh, which will tackle how we can ensure CRPD compliance when it comes to employment programming. So with that being said, and again, to underscore how thankful we are um, at the Zero Project Conference, I would like to hand it over to the Inclusion International team and um, please take it away. And thank you again from all of us at the Zero Project. Thank you, uh, Robin, and thank you, Zero. My name is Sue Swenson. I'm president of Inclusion International. I do wanna say I've been very um, wowed by all zero conferences that I've been able to attend. And I'm particularly grateful to see so many of our members featured as winners in your categories. My name is Sue Swenson. I'm president of Inclusion International, the global network of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. We are a disabled people's organization or DPO. We have more than 200 member organizations of people with intellectual disabilities and their families working in more than 115 countries around the world. We also welcome the solidarity of associate members and individual members. All of our members share a commitment to our statement of unity, which describes our values and our principles. Please see our website if you would like to join or read our statement of unity. If you agree with it, we really welcome you to join us. Housekeeping details for today for participants who would like to use captioning. If you are on Zoom, you can hover your mouse over the bottom bar where the chat box and the Q&A buttons are and click the button that says closed captioning. Once you have clicked closed captioning, you also have to click show subtitles and then the captioning will appear. We also use external captioning and the link to that is posted in the chat box. If you are on Facebook, following along on Facebook Live, we will post the link to the captioning in the comments on the video. And if you are watching on the Zero Project platform, we will post the captioning link in the chat box. If during our presentation you have a question for a panelist, we plan to have time for questions after the presentations. We will collect the questions throughout the presentations and then panelists will respond at the end of the call. If you are on Zoom, please click on Q&A in the bottom menu bar and enter your questions there. Enter them whenever they occur to you, we'll collect them. If you are on Facebook Live, please write your questions in the comments section of the video. And if you are watching through the Zero Project platform, please write your questions in the chat box and we will include them as well. This webinar is being recorded and you can find the recording of today's session and all of our past sessions at inclusion-international.org. Our topic today is employment of people with intellectual disabilities. Why is that important? Why is it important that it be compliant with the CRPD? During our World Congress in 2018, hundreds of self-advocates from the, around the world identified the big issues that are important to them. And real jobs for real pay was one of the key calls to action that they identified. Self-advocates called for jobs that recognize their right to work outlined in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which means access to jobs with support and reasonable accommodation at equal pay rates to their colleagues without intellectual disabilities and in inclusive environments. My son, Charlie, tried hard to have a job in a, in a workplace. He was a very gregarious guy, 
and he liked to be with a bunch of people. Turned out that the only thing we could finally make work for him after many years of trying was self-employment. But he enjoyed that too. And he had connections to his neighbors whose dogs he was walking at the community rate of pay. And um, he had a lot of relationships with the community because of his job. It made him feel proud to be out there every day and have people depending on him. He had keys to their houses. He had a schedule he had to keep. And his staff person helped him do that. And uh, it was a really important part of his life. So what do we know about CRPD compliance in employment? Inclusion International recently released a report on the exclusion of people with intellectual disabilities in projects and programs funded by Official Development Assistance or ODA. The report found that during 2018, 36% of the projects funded by ODA promoted segregation and violated the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We also analyzed rates of CRPD compliance by sector and employment and livelihoods projects were even less likely to be CRPD compliant with 38% of employment programs that included people with intellectual disabilities in 2018 violating the CRPD. This data confirm what self-advocates and families told us about work during our consultations in Nigeria, Bangladesh, Uganda, and Kenya. Self-advocates told us that when they get jobs, their rights are often violated. They are not paid a fair wage. They are not supported at work. And probably worst of all, they are excluded by their coworkers. Families told us that people with intellectual disabilities are discriminated against for employment and that self-employment is often treated as the only option because inclusion in formal sector workplaces is so rare. The goal of this session is to address this gap of CRPD compliance in employment programming so that organizations have the tools to make their programming make sure their programming is consistent with CRPD and to make sure it's genuinely inclusive. We will have one speaker discuss the basic elements of CRPD compliant programming, and then three speakers from Inclusion International member organizations will share their good practice examples for CRPD compliant employment programming. I would now like to introduce the speakers. I will introduce them all at once at the beginning and then they will speak. Connie Lauren Bowie is the first speaker. She is the Executive Director of Inclusion International, the global network of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. Connie, Connie is based in Canada. Connie will be speaking about the current CRPD compliance issues we see in employment programming and discussing the key criteria for developing CRPD compliant programming. Thomas Holberg is from LEV. He is the political advisor at LEV, the National Network for People with Intellectual Disabilities and their families in Denmark. Thomas will be speaking about KLAP Job, LEV's program that supports people with intellectual disabilities to access employment in Denmark. Sylvia Munoz is representing Plena Inclusion, the National Federation of the of intellectual disability movement in Spain, which is made up of 19 regional federations and almost 900 organizations throughout Spain. Sylvia will be speaking about Plena Inclusión's public employment project, which opened up government jobs to people with intellectual disabilities. And last, Puja Gopi is with Inclusion Mauritius. She is the project director for Inclusion Mauritius a federation representing organizations in Mauritius that advocate and work for people with intellectual disabilities. Puja will be speaking about Inclusion Mauritius's employment program, which supports employers to be more inclusive and builds self-advocacy capacity for people with intellectual disabilities. We will now go to our panelists. I would like to ask you to please hand off to the next speaker if possible. Um, I can do that if needed. 
I now hand the platform to Connie Lauren Bowie of Inclusion International. Connie. Good morning. Thank you, Sue. Um, I'm really pleased to be with you today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We are sorry we're not in Vienna together to be able to um, enjoy our usual um, zero conference environment where we get to be together and see each other. Um, I'm really pleased uh, today that we will have three excellent um, country examples of good practices in um, employment that are CRPD compliant. Um, those will be from our members in our network and it's a really interesting mix. We have a, a Danish, Mauritian and Spanish examples. So I think it really helps to show what um, in employment, inclusive employment looks like in very different contexts. Um, I'm supposed to talk today specifically about what CRPD compliance looks like and what it does not look like on Article, on article 27. Uh, I don't know from my team if I have one slide that I was going to put up, but if not, it's fine. Um, it looks like it's coming, there you go. Um, so, so really just the 101 of Article 27. Um, what does the CRBD say about inclusive employment? And um, like other articles in the convention, the elements of the article really help you think through what needs to be in place to make inclusion happen and what, um, what the, the basis of the human rights uh, texts are. So basically Article 27 establishes the right to work. It also establishes the right to be paid on an equal basis with others for that work. It establishes the right to reasonable accommodation in the workplace. And we'll come back to some discussion about what that means. Um, and it, it establishes the right to be free from discrimination in the workplace and in the recruitment process. It means that people have the right to choose their work. So they get to decide what it is they want to do in, in work uh, so that they aren't forced into jobs that are identified uh, specifically for them, but things that they themselves have chosen. And I think fundamentally and probably most importantly, the right to an open, inclusible, inclusive and, and accessible work environment. Um, other articles that are relevant to the right to work in Article 27 include um, Article 3, which is the full and effective participation in society, and Article 4 and 9, which include accessibility um, and other articles in the convention. I will come back to some of that in a moment. Before I um, talk about what some of the key issues in the current employment models that we've seen are, um, I want to just reflect on um, this session is really focused on our members and people with intellectual disabilities. And I think for the audience, um, many at the Zero Project come from different disability um, uh, movements and organizations. I think it's really critical to understand that um, like in education or in other aspects of inclusion, including people with intellectual disabilities requires a different level of support and accommodation. It doesn't necessarily mean more or more expensive. It means understanding that inclusion is more than an accommodation. So being able to say, I need this thing to enable me to do my job, very often uh, Organize, people with disabilities in other, um, other kinds of disabilities are able to identify what that thing is. Is it a piece of technology? Is it a ramp for a wheelchair? Is it um, related to sign language? Is it um, many, many very specific things that people require to do their jobs? Those are fundamental rights outlined in the convention. And for a person with an intellectual disability, there may in fact be some very specific accommodations that people need. However, accommodation alone does not allow people with intellectual disabilities to, participation, to participate um, fully. And what I mean by that is if, if I've been given a piece of technology, it does not mean that the work environment and the people I'm working with uh, are able to support and include me in the work. So that the the um, obligation under the CRPD is that people be given um, 
accessible work environments, which means, for example, having your work coworkers understand how to communicate with you or having your boss understand that you need help and un know understanding what time you're supposed to be at work. There, there are many ways that accommodation can happen that aren't a piece of technology or accommodation that can be quantified and attached to the person. Um, so, so that's just my sort of precursor to, uh, you know, a focused conversation on including people um, who tend to get forgotten and left behind in our work. Um, and I think you'll hear from our um, panelists more detail about what that looks like in, in good practice. Um, I'm going to try to hit just some key points here. Um, what we've seen in, uh, Sue's mentioned this in terms of the uh, recent report we did on ODA spending, what we've seen <clears throat> in non-CRPD compliant models in our analysis of ODA funding, but also in our experience working with organizations in higher income countries, is this misunderstanding that somehow when you're supporting people with intellectual disabilities to work, it's different than what you would do to support um, people to be included. So I've, I'm, um, what tends to happen is that when people do pay attention to intellectual disability, which often they don't, they tend to focus on the person and uh, creating, creating therapies and workshops and special and programming. And so we end up with um, a lot of initiatives that are focused on segregated environments, sheltered workshops, other forms of segregation, um, a denial of access and, a, and usually a lack of understanding of what reasonable accommodation should be. Um, there's an over-reliance, uh, particularly in ODA spending on livelihood models, which are really about volunteering. They're not, um, they're not paid employment initiatives. Um, lots of focus on vocational training, which is, you know, focused on skills development and really doesn't have a pathway to real employment. Um, and very uh, fundamentally, most of those programs where they exist focus on um, or don't focus on giving people choice about what the work is that they want to do. It's often, here's the job that we give to people with intellectual disabilities. You take it or you leave it. Um, so, so switching gears to what, what CRPD compliant programming does look like. Um, some elements are that it needs to take into uh, a holistic approach to employment um, and that it is employment in the open labor market, that it is part of real work for real pay. Um, real CRPD compliant initiatives um, reimagine and redesign inaccessible systems to be more inclusive. Uh, the CRPD compliant approaches do not focus solely on the individual level. Um, very often we see employment, I'll give an example here, uh, that's so-called employment programming that's really focused on helping a person write their resume or helping their person with some perceived uh, skill set that they need. Very little attention to what happens in the labor market and where where the labor market can be um, uh, made to be inclusive so a person could be employed. Um, and the uh, CRPD compliant approaches should not be limited to um, only looking at the principles outlined in Article 27. They must also comply with other parts of the CRPD, including meaningful engagement with uh, organizations of people with disabilities. Um, so. Uh, employers as a resource can and should be turning to organizations of persons with disabilities to help them think about how to be inclusive in the labor market. Um, and then I would just add that um, CRPD compliant uh, programming um, needs to also take into account other uh, aspects of people being included in the community. And here I'll give the example of transportation. So if you are unable to get to work, um, then, it, and transportation is not accessible to you, then um, 
a sustainable, you know, labor market participation can be uh, very difficult. So Article 27 needs to be seen in a broader community uh, context. I'm conscious of time, Sue, so I'm going to uh, wrap it there. I think that the next panelists will give us um, some really good concrete examples of what it looks like when it's done well. Um, and we can pull out some of the comparisons to the CRPD when we get to the questions and answers. Thank you. Thanks, Connie. And thanks for moderating the questions and answers for us later. So I know you'll be watching what's coming in. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. One moment, I'll get my presentation started. First of all, I would like to thank Inclusion International and the Zero Project for giving us this uh, excellent opportunity to present the work of the Club Job. Uh, I will uh, try to give uh, a brief uh, work through what is exactly what we do in Club Job, and I will try to uh, tell you about some of the results of our work. Uh, first of all, Club Job is. Uh, was established in 2009 by uh, Leo, who uh, works for inclusion for people with the intellectual disability. And um, the whole idea of Club Job is uh, to make uh, real uh, work life inclusion uh, on the concept of moving people from a sheltered workshop out to the open uh, labor market. Uh, we create jobs for people with intellectual disabilities, but we don't uh, focus uh, uh, on specific uh, disabilities or diagnos diagnosis. Uh, we focus as, we have a focus on the, uh, the citizen's ability to work. Um, but what is it that uh, exactly that we do? You can say that uh, the CLAP job is a, a job first uh, project. Uh, our analysis uh, in Denmark, but I'm quite sure that it's relevant for a number of other countries, is that one of the key issues, one of the key problems of making a real a work life inclusion is that there simply aren't any real jobs that, uh, that uh, could be sought out by people with intellectual disabilities. So that's why that uh, we focus on on creating jobs that are um, that are suited, that are customized for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, we do that in uh, corporations, in in close cooperation with uh, big uh, companies. Uh, we try to identify tasks or parts of a function that could be solved uh, by people with intellectual disabilities, and then we. You can say that uh, we don't focus on creating one specific job. We've, we try to focus to, uh, to create a, a whole type of jobs. Um, also, that's, uh, if you have to characterize uh, Clap Jobs work, you, you would say that we are uh, a large scale operation. And by that, I mean that um, we make uh, nationwide agreements with uh, with large companies, some of them international, other of them uh, uh, large companies in, in in retail in Denmark primarily, and then we make a, we make one central agreement with a company, and in uh, in cooperation with the company, as mentioned, we try to define a club job, and then uh, the one the type of club job is then implemented in all the local branches of these uh, nationwide companies. Uh, that's, uh, that's why we always have uh, minimum 200 job openings uh, that people with intellectual disabilities and other disabilities can search out and in different, uh, different lines of business. Uh, If we go to uh, to say a little bit more about our results, uh, you can see that Clapjob 
has uh, has been here for over 12 years now but it takes time and it takes effort to build something up uh, like uh, our operation uh, but now we have uh, a job production around the area of uh, five to six hundred people every year uh, in Danish context that's uh, that's uh, that's a lot uh, we have about uh, 3,500 full-time supported jobs in Denmark. So we are a big player in our, in our own country. I think also that uh, through the years we had, uh, of course, gained uh, a lot of knowledge and we have gained um, uh, some you could call them key learnings about uh, what is required to include people with intellectual disabilities. Um, first of all, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, there has to be, is in our experience, a business case for the company. Um, there has to be an equilibrium between the cost and value for the employer. Um, and that, uh, that's the case with clap job. Uh, they are willing, our experience is like the companies are, are quite willing to include people with intellectual disabilities, but it has to be made easy for them and it has to be um, with some kind of uh, government support or funding of the wage. Uh, the inclusion must take place while allowing the companies to focus on their businesses, not the legal framework or not the public administrative uh, procedures. That is, uh, that's the task that we perform. We handle the contact with the municipalities and we handle uh, the legal framework for the companies. Uh, actually, we also uh, regularly come about some, uh, you could call obstacles. Uh, a lot of the, of these uh, uh, sheltered uh, workshops, they actually want their citizens to stay. Uh, our analysis is that some of them have an economical self-interest in doing so. And uh, uh, sometimes we have to work uh, tried quite intensely uh, to get the, the, the citizens from the sheltered workshop and out into the open labor market. And then I think uh, our, our final uh, learning is that uh, success requires cooperation. Uh, the company has the jobs, the authorities, the municipalities, they are a key factor in the legal framework. Uh, and Club Job is in between making connection with, this, uh, with these two worlds. Uh, that's very important that, that every part uh, takes um, every organization that everybody takes part in the solution. Finally, I just wanted to show our self-advocate. Uh, we have a core of uh, ambassadors. Uh, from the left, it's Asbjorn, it's Leia and uh, John Allen, Mick and Bjorn. Uh, they have a task, they help us with the PR and media. Actually, many of them uh, have met uh, ministers and politicians, local mayors. Uh, they are quite uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, they um, often self make contacts with media and they help us promoting club job and they help us um, uh, promoting um, the, the, the concept of inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, also, they help with, uh, with, with guidance. They uh, give counsel to other uh, people with intellectual disability. Perhaps they work in a shelter workshop and uh, are afraid uh, of uh, a job in the open labor market. They can call some of our ambassadors and, uh, and get counseling. That's it for me. Brief presentation of Clapjob. Thank you very much, Thomas. And I am now going to hand the floor to Sylvia. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank for you, Sylvia. 
Thank you very much for your introduction. And thank you very much to Inclusion Europe for inviting us to, to this session. Uh, I am going to share my screen as well. One second. Okay, thank you. So as Sue said before, uh, my name is Silvia Muñoz and I work in Plena Inclusion. Uh, Plena Inclusion is the organization that defends the rights of people with intellectual disabilities and their families in Spain. And uh, the project that we are going to be talking about is this, this project about uh, promoting the public uh, the employment in the public sector for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, this project is uh, within a broader project from Plena Inclusion to promote employment of, of people uh, with intellectual disabilities in compliance with Article 27. And we do we promote innovation, we do uh, lobby actions, uh, we develop uh, services to support employment, and we uh, develop this uh, public this employment in, in, public, in the public sector. Just to give you a general overview of the situation of people with intellectual disabilities in, in Spain regarding the, the employment, uh, as you might say, uh, as you might, might see in this in this slide, uh, the, the activity rate of people with intellectual disabilities is uh, lower than uh, this of the, the the activity rate of the general population, and the employment uh, rate is is also uh, lower, much lower than the general population or even that, uh, than people with uh, disabilities in, in general. Uh, another, um, another indicator of the situation of people with intellectual disabilities in Spain is the, the wages, the salaries. And as you might see here in this, in this slide, the, the wages of people with intellectual disabilities in Spain are uh, lower than the wages of the general population or, or even the wages of the, the average wages of, the, of people with disability. So uh, this is uh, just to, to explain how important it is to, to promote employment in the public sector for people with intellectual disabilities because these uh, jobs allow uh, people to, to have a, a good job, a job that's, that is permanent and a, and a job that uh, tends to have a, a higher wages than those that you can see in the, in the slide. Um, we started to work uh, in 2012 in this project, and uh, we, uh, we started to work in collaboration with the Ministry of uh, Public Employment in Spain. Uh, they wanted to, to build up a call, a, a specific call of public employment for people with uh, intellectual disabilities, and they uh, got in contact with us to make sure that the call was accessible. Um, a, a few months ago, uh, a, a guide, uh, some guidelines were published by uh, the European Commission about how to put a reasonable, reasonable, reasonable accommodation into, into practice. And one of the uh, practices that are uh, um, in this guide is the, the practice from the government of the province of Biscay in Spain. This is a region that has put in practice the knowledge that we gain uh, collaborating with the, with the uh, Ministry of Public Employment. So uh, we are very happy that this uh, um, experience is collected in this, in this document. Um, the reason uh, why we started to work with the Ministry of uh, Public Employment is because in 2011, uh, uh, some uh, policy came into practice in Spain. Uh, this, this policy said that uh, all the uh, public employment uh, calls in, in the public administration uh, should have a quota of a 2% for people with intellectual disabilities, specifically for intellectual disabilities. Uh, previously, we had a quota of 5% for people with disabilities. And the problem was that people with intellectual disabilities uh, were not able to, to accept public employment because uh, there wasn't any uh, accessibility measures specific, specific for them. So they were, uh, being, uh, they were behind in the, in the public employment sector. So as I said, in, in 2011, this changed. And uh, the, the government uh, decided that they wanted to collaborate with us to make sure that uh, these uh, specific calls were accessible. Well, in here you can see some of the organizations that have been uh, supporting the, the project. And uh, 
and I am going to, to explain to you some of the uh, steps that we have followed in order to make these specific goals accessible for people with intellectual disabilities. In the slide, you, you can see that I am uh, all the time talking about Article 27, but also about Article uh, 9 of the UN. Uh, accessibility is, is the, the basis of this, of this project. So, uh, well, we, we supported the public administration in preparing the, the employment call. Uh, in Spain, uh, the, the way to access the public employment is through an exam. I think that in many European countries, the, the process is, is similar. So, all the people interested in, the, in, in the public employment has to go through an exam. Um, so we, we supported the public administration in preparing the, the document that explained how the exam had to be uh, done. Uh, we also do, did a job analysis uh, because the, the public administration were very sure about which jobs were better for, for, for people with intellectual disabilities. So we did this, this job analysis to decide the, the type of job. Uh, we also develop uh, easy to read training materials for candidates so they could uh, prepare the, the exam, they, they could read the, the contents to prepare the, the exam in easy to read. Uh, so one of the things that we did to, to prepare these this, uh, easy to read materials was to, to collaborate with the public administration because we knew, we knew how to do the easy to read, but they knew the contents uh, that uh, had to be written in the, in the training material. So that was a collaborative uh, work. Uh, we also worked together to decide the format of the exam, because in other exams, they had to, uh, people had to write a lot, and we thought that that wasn't accessible. So we decided that uh, the, the test, uh, that uh, they should do a test uh, with three alternatives uh, of responses. Um, we also uh, develop uh, easy to read materials about the whole process. So the call was written in easy to read. Uh, we also develop uh, examples of the exams, like mock exams, uh, exercises, the application, uh, the application where the candidates uh, have to, to, to say that they were interested. The other thing that we did was, uh, apart from collaborating with, with the public administration, uh, we supported our own organizations uh, to uh, people with intellectual disabilities and families through the whole process. So we, we uh, provided them with training mater ma materials and uh, we did that uh, through an online platform. Uh, um, in the year 2011, we also built up an, an application, an online application, so anyone interested would have information about uh, public employment calls and um, download uh, training materials and exams. And, yeah. uh, we uh, disseminate information about the whole process because sometimes uh, uh, public employment calls might be, uh, might, might be a little bit complex to, to follow. And we uh, provided support with that, with, with questions and with queries from, from anyone. Uh, we also have been, uh, we also had assessment meetings with the public sector administration to evaluate and improve the, pro the process. Uh, in, in this slide, you can see uh, the, um, the number of specific calls that we had. As you can see, loads, nearly 10,000 people have applied for, for public employment calls. 
And something very interesting is that 75% of the people uh, passed the exam. So uh, people from public administration were very happy that they that we had uh, such a good students and candidates. Some of the results that we got uh, with this project with this project are documents and um, events, conferences. I am uh, um, focusing on, on this conference because I think it was very important. In this conference, we managed to get in the same room people from maybe 10 or 15 uh, regional administrations. So it was a very important uh, moment because uh, many of the learnings that of the learnings that we gained at national level were disseminated into the into the regional governments, and we are very happy because the, the, this this slide only uh, record, uh, collects information from the national uh, uh, calls of public employment. But we know that there are many, many more people with intellectual disabilities accessing public employment because it's not only the national uh, administration that is delivering these specific calls, but also the regional, uh, the regional government. So this is very, this is very good. We have developed some documents, like good practice guidelines, a protocol for public administrations that wants to do a, a public employment call. Um, we have some good experiences from from all from some regions in here. So the project is is developing uh, very very well in the whole of Spain, and we are very very happy with that. And but there are some challenges still. So uh, people with more complex needs uh, that also have the right to employment but are not are not accessing still a public employment. So we need to to work on that. We are also interest, interested in, in offer different job profiles for people with intellectual disabilities, a promotion, the promotion right now is not happening and uh, this is something that should be improved. Okay, so uh, I mean, we have been working uh, a lot, but uh, there are still some, some changes and some improvements to, to make in the, in the project. Um, okay, I am aware of the time, so I'm, I'm going to finish, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for your brilliant work with all of your members, and particularly personally, thank you for your focus on people with more complex needs, too. We must not leave anyone behind. Our next speaker is Pooja from Mauritius. Pooja, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Yes. Can you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you. So thank you so much, first of all, for giving us the opportunity to share our about our employment programming today. So I'm going to share a lot about the process itself. Uh, first of all, Inclusion Mauritius, it's a federation of 12 NGOs in Mauritius, and uh, we are a lot in lobbying and self-advocacy. I'm very sorry if, if uh, we have a very bad connection. I apologize in advance for this. So if it costs, please raise a hand or let me know about that. Uh, so I'm going to speak about the core services, first of all. We conduct a lot of research and lobbying on different cross-disability issues, and uh, we offer training on self-advocacy, skilling, technical training, and employment of young adults with disabilities. As a federation of NGOs, we are a lot in awareness raising and lobbying on intellectual disabilities and related facts. And we work a lot with government bodies as well to make, our, to make the rights become a nationwide issue. And we offer employment program for persons with disabilities and also their parents as well. So, uh, I will highlight about two main legislations in Mauritius. First of all, the UNCRPD was signed in 2007 and ratified in 2010. And we have one main act related to the Article 27 Right to Work in Mauritius, which is the TEDPB, the Training and Employment of Disabled Persons Act 1996. It is based on a quota system. Uh, so I explain to you the detail. If you have a workforce of 35 or more people in your company, you have the obligation to employ 3% of that workforce as person with disabilities. 
And uh, if uh, you don't employ these amendments and uh, there's a uh, fine to pay. So employers, companies uh, who have an obligation to employ in Mauritius, whether the profile matches or not. Yes. So basically, currently Inclusion Mauritius is supporting 2,500 to 3,000 beneficiaries in Mauritius. And uh, we started the self-advocacy program in 2014 with 18 only, and we have 110 self-advocates currently. And uh, we have also trained over 300 candidates through the employment program. And currently we have 41 candidates in employment. We have five entrepreneurs in different sectors, and we have 170 currently in different training of inclusion Mauritius. So I will speak a bit about the training of candidates. It is uh, based on a right based model, of course. So our most basic training is a self advocacy training. And then we forward them to the independent living training, the technical skills training, professional development skills training, and we have also the entrepreneurship training. As you can see, it is a progress based training. First of all, they are they go to the self advocacy training to become leaders and make their voices heard when they are really ready at the level of character building and leadership. Then we try to forward them to other training pertaining to placements, employments or entrepreneurship. The training involves not only technical, but social skills, life skills, and all the skills needed, which will make our beneficiaries autonomous and independent. So here is the process. The process is yet yeah, quite easy. So basically after the self-advocacy training, there's a socialization and leadership program because we focus a lot on, on uh, our beneficiaries not being victims of discrimination. The article 27 itself speaks a lot about the equal rights. So they learn a lot about socialization, what are the rights and as leaders, what they should do in their life to face, to, to promote themselves and of course, so that they do not get victims of discrimination. Then they go to the support and employment programming, then to the skilling training, technical training. After that, when they are ready, we place them in, in, a, in a workplace or a placement program where they include them some in the workplace adjustment program for candidates. Here you will see that not only the candidates, the candidates mean the beneficiaries, but the employers and the co-workers as well are involved in the workplace adjustment program. Because we believe for a conducive environment, it's important to not only help the candidates, but the employers and co-workers also needs coaching. And so that they, if they have any ignorance about the disability, they will get ready to work with them in a very friendly environment. When the workplace adjustment program is done, we focus a lot on their career plan, on the human resource development plan, and the job coaching follows. When we speak about inclusive employment, of course, we need to open the access to employment. So we basically work with private companies and also with social enterprises. We make sure that the companies, first of all, know about the CRPD, the Article 27, and also about the TEDPB Act. When we collaborate with Business Mauritius as well, which is an institution under the government body in Mauritius, which regroups all the private companies. Our target is to get most, a maximum of companies under one roof. So with our collaboration with Business Mauritius, we get all the companies for the workshops, socialization activities, and we get social enterprises as well to learn and know what Inclusion Mauritius does and about the abilities of persons with intellectual disability. We also do yearly events, yearly events like uh, we just did an ABLE event. It, an, it is an event where employers and the general public were invited to come to a, to a shop where only persons with intellectual disabilities were handling the shop. So it was a live experience where employers get to know, get to interact and learn about persons with disabilities and how they function in a working, in a workplace.
So these kind of events is like an interactive platform where in practical life you get to know about them. And of course, uh, they are self-advocates. They, they, they often have the opportunity to speak a lot about not only their abilities, but their dreams and what they want to do in life as well. So basically, these, these are... These things not only help us to awareness raising about inclusive employment, but also to promote the abilities of our beneficiaries. So je, uh, I will present you to Jordana, Anusha, Emily and Jean-Patrice. These are our beneficiaries who started from the self-advocacy and went in the employment programming. So basically these four are now working at the good shop and uh, they have been working for more than two years now. So what, what makes them a success story for, them, for us is that uh, whenever there's an issue, they know how to handle it. They are not people who are dependent on our support persons or job coaches. They have been inspiration to many other self-advocates. And today they have been promoted in different departments of Good Shop. And when you see these people, they, they just inspire you the way they have worked on themselves. Now I would address a bit about the good practices. So the typical Mauritian employment programming is all about the training and skilling, regardless of the person's interest, talent, or abilities. They usually match the, the job and candidate profile, and the job scope is decided very much in advance. Candidates are eligible only to visit, and uh, most of the time, they, they tend to work around six to one year, and very, very less people can, can really retain their jobs. Inclusion Mauritius employment programming make the difference because they are trained, first of all, to be self-advocate and leaders, and they are treated as candidates rather than persons with disabilities who are just beneficiaries. And also parents are empowered to become support persons wherever they are at the job place within their family or they are alone. They, 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 are, they have the support and parents have the possibility to coach them when the job coaches and support persons are not, are not with them. And uh, the job coaching and counseling for career development is a, is a success for inclusion Mauritius because within that support Thank and you. counseling system. Uja, I'm sorry, we're, we're getting notice from the organizers that we're gonna, the, the session's gonna end in five minutes and we're gonna go oh. offline. So that means we are right at the end of our session. I apologize for cutting you off. Okay, okay, no problem. I, so, I, yeah, I, we'll share your, your PowerPoint um, with participants. Uh, haven't, I don't know what the logistics of how to do that are. Um, we have five minutes, Sue. I know that's a short amount of time. I had a number of questions that came through, which I'm afraid we're not going to get to. However, maybe I can just outline some of the issues that the question, the 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 audience has raised. Thank you. And yes. And maybe there's a way for us to share that generally. So yep. um, questions we've had are to do with people with significant disabilities. Each of the presenters has touched on those very briefly. I think that that's a question people would like more information about. How do we support people with significant disabilities in work? Um, some questions around the gap where people have not been included in education, um, effective quality education, how do we prepare and, and transition? Um, other questions are around um, the uh, approaches to like legislative approaches. So the quota system um, compared to uh, focusing on private sector employers, working with the employer, working with self-advocates, some um, questions around the quota system. So I think there's, there's an enormous amount there that we'd like to um, pick up on. I'm really sorry that we won't be able to answer those questions, but perhaps we at inclusion could offer to follow up with those questions and give people some written um, materials to help respond. I think I can probably safely say that we will also do as much as we can on our website. Mm -hmm. So where we have um, an opportunity to perhaps answer some of the questions next to the, um, 
the, the record that we have of this meeting. I just wanna thank quickly before we are cut off, everyone who spoke, you are all brilliant. I want to thank all everyone who attended. Your attention has been very important to us. We hope you will continue the conversation with us as we go forward. And um, thanks to everyone. Thank you to the Zero Conference for giving us this platform. Thanks, Onward everyone. CRPD. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.